I really want to get to the bigger questions of where your philosophies come from rather than kind of what they are, partially because um, you know, your philosophy has been laid out so many times in the past by you, by others, and, and these things. Um, and also because I think what's kind of personally most inspiring about punk and DIY mentality is that you can kind of form your own philosophy rather than just like a someone else forms a philosophy and then now I'm going to live by your philosophy instead of like I think that's what I found so inspiring about punk and DIY in the first place. So I want to really talk about eventually ultimately where these ideas come from, but I do think we need some kind of like uh, introduction. I think we need to start at some somewhere at kind of the beginning. So um, this may sound like a really stupid question or silly question um, to ask you. Um, but when did you start making music that you kind of felt like other people needed to hear? In other words, you know, when were you making something, you know what, I think more people should hear this than, than myself. Um, I started playing in bands as a teenager, 16, 17 years old, um, in the late 1970s. Uh, and f it was always, um, um, like being in a band and making music was always a uh, selfish thing um, I, I don't I didn't then and I don't now care if other people are into it so um, the framing that I thought you know I think other people need to hear this is kind of s slightly alien to me I know what you're getting at and I don't want to be dismissive of the question but my take on music has always been that um, the people making it are doing it for their own reasons and every now and again it interfaces with the rest of the world and if other people like it that's great but uh, if they don't you know fuck them I'm not gonna not stop you know and I think that's true for the vast vast majority of people that make music there are a very small number of people who work in music as a profession where it's something of an obligation for them to play music and they only do it because they're being paid I think that's a very very small number of people um, in terms of percentage, I think people play music for the same reason that they go ice skating or ballroom dancing or uh, play chess or learn fencing or whatever, any of the a million other things that people do because they're satisfying in their own right. Uh, and I wanted to be in a band because being in a band is fucking awesome, you know? And I, I wanted to play music with my friends because playing music is fucking awesome and I wanted to do shows because being at shows is awesome you know everything about it was just a matter of being a participant in an experience rather than me creating a product that I hoped would like resonate with other people I felt and I still feel like a almost any decent music is made with a, if not a majority, a healthy dose of disinterest in the, the listening audience. Because, I mean, you can tell instantly when you're listening to something, if someone is doing it for effect, it's like when somebody does a goofy line and a facial expression and, and waits for the applause. You know, like you can tell when somebody is doing something that isn't necessary, that they're just doing for effect. And that's maybe easier to tell in music than in any other art form that you can tell somebody has just done this little gimmick because that's what's expected to Some, of him. Sometimes someone literally asks you to please clap, but generally <laughs> yeah, yeah. you don't yeah. You don't generally get that kind of thing. But I think what you're saying is actually exactly why I asked the question. I feel like that does fit in so much with your philosophy and everything you're all about, and yet at the same time there is this notion, okay, I need to bring my band on tour. I need to get my records out there and so there must have at some point you must have been sort of fucking around with the music like you're saying and got to a point where like you know what I think this is something I need to people should hear this besides me so I of course I, you're making it for yourself that's what's driving it but I think talking about like the music industry or whatever you even want to call that there's mm -hmm. at some level there's this notion of like getting it out there in some urgency or some need and I guess that's why I'm kind of wondering when did that really begin like I want to make music for other you know, people almost immediately my band started like we played house parties in town and we played at a frat house and we played at a high school and we played at a local bar and and all of these shows were disasters and but that was you know I'm I, I'm forever grateful for the experience of having eating shit in front of people in a band that I thought was the greatest thing I'd ever done, you know? There's something really educational about that, and I feel like it's it confirmed all of my biases up to that point, which were that 
those of us in the band are really on it and we have our shit together and we're right about everything. And if other people don't get it, then they're the assholes, you know? <laughs> uh, and so I feel like that, that mentality has kind of underwritten everything that I've ever done. It's all, it's all been done for its own sake rather than a, as a mechanism to get popularity or to make a living or to extend the profile of the band or something. Everything, we've, everything I've, I've been involved in has been because that thing itself is awesome. You know, yeah. And so it sounds like you're talking about the pre-big black era. For now, the house yeah. playing parties and things like that. So you've also talked a lot in other um, interviews about your and, and just other things about how much you've been inspired by the Ramones. Um, yeah. What about the Ramones? I guess was so inspiring, or maybe continues to be so inspiring. Well, if it is before there before I w was aware of the Ramones, like my perception of rock music was colored by what I had seen up to that point, which was sort of mainstream rock music. My brother had some like classic hard rock records, Alice Cooper and The Who and things like that. And so I, I was a aware of rock music, but it had this this patina of phoniness about it. You know, you had Alice Cooper wearing glam clothes and makeup and doing magic tricks on stage and you know, you had, you know, The Who had a fucking opera. You know, like, <laughs> it, there seemed to be this gulf between rock music and normal day-to-day -day life that was part of the reason that it existed. Like, rock music was meant to be this grand thing, or it was presented as this grand thing that special people did that was elevated and alien from your normal experience. When I stumbled across the Ramones, it was just four assholes like me and my friends, <laughs> and they were singing about all the same stupid shit that we would talk about, and they, had, they seemed to share an irreverence that my, was like the, that was like the lingua franca of my peer group, was that everybody else was a fucking idiot. The four of us in this room making this joke right now, we, ha we know what we're doing. And if they don't, you know, if other people aren't into it, who cares, right? So, and then the, the more I got in my, it made my mind revolve about things. Like they, I got, I, I obsessively listened to their first couple of records and, and they were singing about all these countercultural or crude or irreverent subjects, you know, like transgressive stuff, like Dee Dee sings a song about sucking dick for drug money, you know, like, and how he feels bad that he's not the guy that they picked first, you know? <laughs> so, and, and so suddenly your, your mind is reeling like, wait a minute, this is a guy speaking in honest, open terms about what is supposed to be a degrading thing, but it's not. You know, it's just his life, right? And then you, like, the, the more my mind just revolved on these concepts, I started to realize, like, like, all these perverse things that roll through my mind, maybe they're fair game as well. Like, maybe I can take my own ideas seriously, and then I can express myself in my own way without being ashamed of it. And also, the rest of the world is looking down on all these people, but within their, within their peer group, they revere each other, they elevate each other, they think they are awesome and they're all benefiting from each other. So maybe all of these people that are looked down on around me, maybe I should take those people seriously too, you know? And I really feel like, like I'm, I'm certain I'm reading way more into this than the Ramones intended, right? <laughs> Which is true for everything from the Bible on down, right? So uh, I feel like my path toward becoming a more open-minded person, a person more willing to give other people credit for their personal lives and experiences, and my willingness to take other people seriously, no matter how they differ from me, all of that was started by me seeing the Ramones and seeing like the goofy, irreverent mentality of me and my friends mirrored in the Ramones. That's why the Ramones were important to me. 
I don't, I mean, I still am extremely fond of the Ramones, uh, but the reason I'm fond of the Ramones is that they made me into a better person and they made me see the world, literally see the world and the people in it differently. I mean, I was just mildly interested when you said that if you continued into the remote, like the chrysalis years, the Warner, did you kind of keep, or was it really? They like have a sell-by date, you know? <laughs> Uh, the last great Ramones album is uh, the end of the century, the one that they did with uh, Phil Spector. And it is not great in the way that the earlier Ramones records are great, but it is a great record. Cool. So in, um, in 1981, I believe you started, you started Big Black. I think that's the right year. Um, yeah. Did it feel with that project it was different than these former projects? Like this is going to be a, this is a different type of, thing this is something where it's going to go a little further or is it again it just happened to go further it's a progression like the whole time that i was working up toward the music that en en ended up being released as big the first big black record i was in other bands and some of those ideas were expressed in those other I other bands and then just shot down by the other people in the bands right? um, i was in a, a, a band in chicago called stations who were kind of an arty new wave band and they had uh they used a drum machine and that got me thinking about the possibilities of the drum machine as a, as a distinct uh, voice, as opposed to, um, at the time, there were other bands that used electronic rhythms or drum machines. I was, I was heavily influenced by bands like Suicide and Cabaret Voltaire and Kraftwerk and, uh, to a lesser extent, things like the early Human League and some of the other electronic rock music of the day, right? Most of the people that were using synthetic rhythms or drum machines used them in one of two ways. The first way was just as a, as a metronome, where there was just a thing going and that would just go all night and the band would just play over it. Like Tuxedo Moon's music was like that. Um, uh, Cabaret Voltaire's music was like that. There's a French band called Metal Urbain who were a big influence on me. Their music was like that. And then there were bands that used a drum machine as a kind of a fake drummer, where there would be like rolls and fills and, you know, give the drum machine some drum solo kind of. <laughs> and where the drum machine was trying to mimic the characteristics of a drummer. And that at the time, uh, drum machines were fairly crude and all of those things gave themselves away and they, they were comical. And it, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to be a funny ha-ha band. And I, so what I wanted to do was pursue a utilization of the drum machine that made use of the things that were distinctive and unique about the drum machine. Like it could play a complex pattern flawlessly, relentlessly, <laughs> stop and start on a dime. Um, you could do things that were physical, would it be physically impossible for a real drummer, like play six drums simultaneously on one beat for an accent, that sort of thing. Uh, and you could, if you stumble a pro, a, 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 upon a rhythm, which is very common even for human drummers to like stumble across something and then be unable to replicate it because there's some subtlety about the timing or there's some awkwardness about it where it doesn't fit into your mental framework of the rhythm, it's difficult to replicate. Whereas with a drum machine, if you do something accidentally great once, you just hit save and you're, <laughs> you know. So there were things about the drum machine as a, as, a, as a distinct instrument that I thought made it valuable. And I'm, I'm pleased and proud of the way that my band of the time exploited the drum machine and its eccentricities. And I feel like that, I, I feel like we lost a little something when drum machines got sophisticated enough that they could mimic drummers. And they lost the thread of continuity where I think it, it's conceivable somebody could eventually have become a virtuoso at the drum machine, which would have been an interesting development, but it never got that far. And so um, your first records were released on a label called Ruthless Records, yeah. which as far as I understand was not like a standard label. So what was, what was Ruthless exactly? Ruthless was a cooperative collective label that was run by several bands in Chicago. We just pooled our resources and got a P.O. box and then we agreed that every band would pay for their own records and make and sell their own records, but we would use the same P.O. box, and we would use, you know, pool our money for advertising, and 
um, there was a kind of a rotating schedule of who was responsible for trying to collect the money from distributors and stuff, but it was a, it was a, a collective or cooperative effort. And um, it mirrors something about the Chicago music scene that was super inspirational to me and, and still guides my thinking 30-something years later, which was that everybody involved in the music scene in Chicago what did many things like if you were in a band and and you're and you had a van to drive your band around that also meant that you would be driving all of your friends bands around you know the band Naked Raygun who were um a super important band to me not just because they were a great band but because they were they became friends and they were inspirational in their behavior like they had a rehearsal space they rented a coach house behind a big house in uh, Lincoln Park in Chicago, and they had a rehearsal space in the basement of that coach house. And because they had a rehearsal space, all of their friends' bands also had a rehearsal space, you know. And in their rehearsal space, they had a, a kind of a small PA system set up so that you could hear what was going on in rehearsal. And because they had a little PA system, they also could provide PA for, for gigs, uh, house parties and punk gigs and stuff like that. And I worked for the school newspaper at my university. And because I worked in the printing arts, I had access to a process camera and typesetting and I could make flyers and record covers and such like that for my friends' bands and my band. And, uh, I had some facility as an illustrator, and so I, that made me a, um, a resource for people who needed design done for their flyers or their record covers or whatever. Um, I had to book shows for my band, so I had developed a network of contacts in various places for bands, uh, for shows that, that you could do, which meant that when I came across somebody else who was looking for places to play, they were welcome to my address book and they could help themselves to all of my contacts and we would share information that way. And if they needed a place to play or, and a place to crash in Chicago, I could set up a show for them in Chicago and they could crash at my place. There was this super fraternal, convivial, cooperative mentality at play at that level. Everybody knew that there, were, there weren't that many of us and so if we were going to do anything, we all had to do it simultaneously together as a, as a collective effort. And that still guides my thinking. Like, I still think of myself as being embedded in this community of musicians, which is now a worldwide community. And I still feel like any resource of mine is a resource of the communities. And anything that I can do is not just for my benefit. It's available as a resource to everybody else if they want to take, make use of it. That was the guiding principle behind building the studio. That's the guiding principle behind the way I operate uh, in business as an engineer, freelance, working for other people. It's, it's formed me as a person. Like Being involved in that community of musicians formed my way of thinking about the world. And I, I will for always be in debt to the fact that I fell into the company of a bunch of people who were righteous and were doing things in this collaborative, cooperative way and not into the company of a bunch of self-interested assholes who were like cutthroat and trying to, you know, outdo each other. I feel like if I had fallen into that company, I could easily have been swayed into that way of thinking and then I would be an exploitive businessman like everybody else. So. So, I mean, it, it sounds like a pretty common story for anyone, probably a lot of people in this room that have kind of grown up involved in either punk or DIY communities where everyone is kind of doing everything, you know. At what point, though, was it like, okay, I guess I the, the thing I'm really good at, the thing I'm the best at doing and providing is, is audio engineering, you know, because you could have been running a label or a fanzine or booking or just an, at oh, some point it I fell did into all that stuff and I was bad at all of it. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, it's a self-winnowing process. Like you fail at enough things, and eventually there's one thing that you do better than average, and you just cling to that like a gold sovereign. You know, like okay, well that's what I'm doing from now on. You know, was there a point though when you noticed that that was the thing that you were you know better at than the others, and that's the service you would best uh, provide? Or 
I, th I tried to run Ruthless Records after the other bands involved in Ruthless Records had gotten signed to proper record labels. I tried to carry on running Ruthless Records on my own for a few years, and I, I completely banjaxed it. It was just awful. Um, we managed to put out a few records from some bands that I admired and whose records mean a lot to me. But I ha in order to do it, I got involved with an, a distribution company who later proved to be profoundly criminal. And so uh, in the end, I just abdicated and I gave all of the bands all of their records. And I said, these are your records. You can do what you like with them. I was really bad at this and I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and so uh, giving up on that, giving up on the idea that I could run a record label was important to me um, because it, that meant that I should I, I was free to concentrate on the recording side of things, which I could do, which I had developed a facility for, and I'd been, become made myself useful at. Cool. Um, and that so would have been 1986 or so, some 87, something like that. Um, and so getting back to that big black story, which relates to the collapse of Ruthless. So <laughs> then at some point, I think, and um, I believe in 1984, um, you signed with a label, Homestead. Um, yeah. So we never actually signed with a label, which is, I think, is a, an object lesson. Um, my thinking about it from the beginning was that if we controlled our own material, then we never had to worry about somebody else doing anything to us. If we failed, it would be us failing. Um, but we didn't have to worry about somebody else tripping us and making us fall like it so for from the from the beginning when as soon as I started making records I realized oh yeah if you let somebody else do all the hard part they're going to take the majority of the money so what we did instead was we licensed our records to this distribution company they wanted to sign us to a proper record deal and we declined so after a period all of those records reverted to us. We retained ownership of all of them, and then we were able to, to find another partner to put those records out, Touch and Go Records, and I've been working with Touch and Go Records ever since, so that's 30-something years now that I've, you know, my band Shellac is still on Touch and Go Records, and we still, we, we still put our records out. I did a soundtrack album to a horror film last year and it hasn't been released yet, but it's going to be released on Touch and Go Records. Like, it's just super gratifying to find somebody that you can trust implicitly and just your relationship just naturally progresses. We've never had an agreement with Touch and Go. Like, never, I've never had any kind of a, a, of, a, of a contract with them whatsoever. And I don't use contracts in my normal business. Like, if I'm working for somebody else, I won't sign a contract and I don't expect them to. Um, my thinking about that is that if you in enter into a relationship with somebody and it's satisfying and it works out, then the relationship will naturally continue because it's working out. If you want more from that relationship than is reasonable and you extract that promise from them in a contract, then suddenly you're in an adversarial relationship with somebody. and. Uh, I never wanted to feel like I was forcing someone to do something, and I never wanted someone to feel like they were obligated to do something to, for me. So I, I, I don't use contracts. I mean, if I have to borrow a million dollars to buy a building, I'll use a contract, obviously. But I mean, anything short of that, I, I just don't think contracts have any value. They're, they can't be enforced. Like if you have a gig coming up at a neighborhood bar and you have a contract with that bar and they're $50 short on their guarantee, are you going to fucking sue them for $50? Of course not, right? So what you have is you have uh, an unenforceable arrangement. Now, now let's say you sign a contract with some massive corporation that has a legal department and you fall fractionally short on something. There's nothing preventing them from destroying you with a lawsuit that you have no defense against, you know. So the contracts are useless in as a as a means of enforcing behavior, but they become a powerful weapon when 
someone is beholden by contract to a very powerful institution or party. So if you sign a contract with a big record label, that record label can destroy you like that. But if they don't follow the terms of the contract, if they fall short, your recourse is extremely limited. Like you can go broke trying to sue them, uh, or you can just put up with it. In which case, the contract has no value for you, but it's a very useful weapon for the record company. So I, I, I just don't use contracts because I think that they are a flawed concept and, I, and they are, I think they are a destructive way to frame relationships. So I'm fascinated by, by this because, um, well, first of all, I don't either. Um, and I feel very similar to you, but I feel like I gained this um, understanding from you and your generation and things like Problem of Music and, and uh, you know, that's where I gained these values. Oh, this makes, what you're saying, this makes a lot of sense, right? But there is, the artists you were looking at, like you said, the Ramones, they were on Sire, you know, they sure. probably had an awful contract with their label, they, you know, maybe, right. maybe they maybe didn't, but I guess that's my question, like, at what point were you, were you able to establish, I'm going to do things completely differently in this thing that makes all of this, all of these behavioral things, all developed from the standard practices of my peer group in the underground music scene. Like, when, when all of my friends are in bands and all of them are behaving in a certain way, and I see that it works out, well, then I'm encouraged to work that way myself as well. Like, we didn't pat pattern ourselves after professionals. We patterned ourselves after our intimates, after people that we saw in operation doing things that worked and then we learned from their mistakes when they didn't you know i'm a big advocate of learning from other people's mistakes and um especially in the 90s when there was a a kind of a feeding frenzy after post nirvana there was a kind of a record label feeding frenzy where bands were just being snapped up and then just serially one after another just being signed and destroyed and signed and destroyed and signed and destroyed I mean, I saw that happening around me, and I, I, it was obvious to me that that was a mistake, a categorical mistake to get involved in a system that was just destroying bands <laughs> like at a rapid clip. So, so it, has something changed? Right, We talk about peers, I feel like, in independent communities at that same level now, right? Um, all those middlemen that weren't there around your peers in Chicago seem to be pretty pretty prevalent. And do you think something has changed and what might have caused that change? You mean like booking agents and managers and booking lawyers agents, and that kind of stuff? agents, managers, lawyers, contracts, mm -hmm. all that stuff that you're sort of, you decided yeah. we're going to reject and you still have these relations with touch and go don't seem to... Well, know. simultaneous with this thinking of uh, that me and my group of friends were developing, simultaneous with that way of thinking was a parallel track, which was that instead of operating in this sort of lawless underground, what some people wanted to do was create a kind of a dollhouse version of the regular music business, where you would have a bullshit little dude that would call himself a publicist and charge bands to get their records into a fanzine, for example. Or you would have a bullshit dude that would make a half a dozen phone calls to book a tour and take 15% of the band's income. Like, those little bullshit functionaries, that creeping professionalism was happening simultaneous with this independent thinking that um, I think has clearly proven to be more sustainable. Like, I'm still fucking here doing things exactly the same way that I did, like exactly the same way down to if I want to make a, if I want to book a gig in certain towns, I'm calling the same fucking phone number that I called 30 years ago, <laughs> you know, and then we sh we drive up to the same address and we play in the same club and this, you know, there's the same 300 fucking people there. I mean, my, you know, so uh, like I don't, I don't think, I don't gauge success by maximizing profit. I'm fundamentally not a capitalist. I, I am not a transactional person. Uh, I think the profit motive, motive is a cancer. And I, I think I, I view success as the ability to continue, right? If what I'm doing is valuable for its own sake, then if I get to do it again tomorrow, I have just won today, right? 
a capitalist would look at the bottom line and say, well, if I don't have more money today than I did yesterday, then I failed yesterday. I lost yesterday. And I think that that is a toxic way of thinking. Um, we're all going to go through our lives earning a living one way or another, right? The, that's, um, that's part of the background noise of our lives. It's what we do with each other and with our skills and with our interests. Those are the things that constitute our lives. What you have to do to earn a living is trivial. You know, that means nothing to me. Um, so being in, involved in music for its own sake is its own reward. And it's okay if, you don't, if, it, if it doesn't pay my expenses as well. That's totally fine because I get to keep doing it. You mean you really managed to merge the like hippie free love mentality <laughs> well with the, with the raging dickhead mentality. Like you managed to figure out this way I don't know how you. I don't know how. Yeah. <laughs> but you. Right. I think it's what I've done is I've channeled the hatred of uh, of squares, and <laughs> and merged that with the incredibly warm feeling of community that you get uh, when you're with people who think like you and you're all operating on the same wavelength. You know. I think you're right. So um, like, I I love being in the company of like-minded dickheads. <laughs> They re that's I think in a nutshell, right? That's the <laughs> philosophy. Um, so getting we're fin we're almost done your journey because you really at a certain point weren't on very many other record labels. I'm gonna stop talking about the labels. And you kind of mentioned right your last stop on your journey after Homestead was Touch and Go, and there you've essentially remained there even after. They're 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 not defunct, but they really aren't very active. One, I think right. Shellac is one of the I don't know what else they they don't do very much. So they, they maintain the catalog. They yeah, do they, yeah. like but, special editions and reissues and special projects. Yeah, but um, but not they're not they don't have a roster of currently right. active bands. And yeah. so my, I guess my question is, what about Touch and Go or or maybe Corey or what about what about that has it brought you there in the first place and then kept you just kept you there for so for so long? You know. Well, what there was worked? a there was a, a kind of a. Um, a spate of independent labels that operated in a very specific way, which was that they operated on a, on a profit-sharing model rather than a royalty model. And that has proven to be a very sustainable way of operating. The band Discord operates the same way. I mean, the record label Discord operates the same way out of Washington, D.C. Now, Discord had a very, Discord had a very special identity. They wanted to be uh, parochial, D.C., Baltimore, metro area, specific sort of documenting the scene, right? Uh, Touch and Go was much much more scattershot, like basically anything that interested them, they wanted to work with those people. But um, just to, to bring you up to the front of the boat, the way a lot of records label work, record labels work is that they will provide the band with a budget to record a record and a budget to promote the record and budget for other ancillary expenses. Uh, and then they will pay the band a percentage of the sales of the record from which all of those costs are then recouped. So in that scenario, it's quite feasible that you could spend the entirety of your career technically in the red. That is, your royalties have not m amounted to as much as has been spent on your behalf. Meanwhile, the record label has still turned a profit on every record sold along the way. That's the model that the mainstream business record, that the mainstream music business operated on. That kind of sharecropper accounting was absolutely standard in the mainstream record label business. Um, this group of independent labels operated on a different model, which is whatever money is spent on this record is subtracted from the total income from the record, and whatever's left, we split 50-50. And that profit share model has, a, has a, a, a lot of benefits to it. One of them is that the record label only makes money if the band makes money. So the record label has no incentive to waste your money, whereas in the, in the recoupment paradigm, the record label has an incentive to spend money on your behalf because then they're spreading their influence out within the industry. They, the, their, their guy gets to spend money, but he's spending your money. So he doesn't care how much money he spends on your behalf. And so people use that 
as a means of extending their power and influence within the music business, knowing that they're going to get that money back, right? It's a free play for them. Um, so that, and the other thing that it does is it, it encourages people to be realistic about their expectations. Like if, if you expect from your history that you're going to sell a certain volume of records, then the next record you make should be made commensurate with the number that you expect to sell rather than according to some fanciful notion of what magic album you want to make. Like, you, you can make a, a fantastic album within those expectations, but if you just make the maximally fantastic album, damn the torpedoes, spend as much money as necessary, then it's quite likely that both you and the record label will lose money. And there's a strong disincentive to think fantastically like that. Whereas in the major label paradigm, uh, that is the conventional music business, royalty and recoupment mentality, if you spend all of that money, it doesn't really matter because that money is going to be subtracted from what you might have one day been paid. And the record label is still going to turn their per piece profit on every record that's sold. So I very much like that business model, and Touch and Go has maintained that business model, and it's, that business mo model has also proven very useful in other areas. Like, um, when my band does shows, typically we'll book a show at a venue and we, we won't take a guaranteed price. We'll do some research about the overhead costs of the show, we'll set a ticket price and we'll have a vague idea of what the audience expectation is going to be, and then at the end of the night you subtract the expenses from the income and then you come up with a fair division of the remaining money. And that's the way we've been doing it for, 30, for 25, 30 years. And it, it's great because then the promoter or the local, the venue or whatever, doesn't have to worry about losing money because they basically can't lose money. If you have enough people that walk through the door to cover the expenses, then they're not going to lose money. Um, they, they also don't have to feel any trepidation about booking your band. Like Maybe they're not that familiar with us and they don't know if we're going to draw enough people to cover the guaranteed figure that we would need as a guarantee to make the show worth doing. But we know our audience, and we know that there will be enough people there to make us that much money. But we can convince somebody to let us do a show where they might otherwise have been un unwilling to do it. So this profit-sharing model, I think, is a really, really apt way to do things. And Touch and Go has always done things that way, and that's one of the many reasons that we've stayed with them. Wow, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you, you kind of brought that mentality that you're talking about to the studio, right? Um, from a refusal to take points on a record, which I think is really a big thing, but also even to just sort of do a determination to almost accessibility. Like, you'll kind of record whoever books you, yeah, somebody, give or take. Right? Somebody asked earlier today, like, how do you decide who you're going to work with? And I, I said, well, they, I don't pick them. They pick me, <laughs> you know? I answer the phone, and whoever's on the other end, if they want to make a record, I, I try very hard to say yes. Yeah, I mean, know? that's unfortunately radical, right? And I mean, I think yeah. also, like, the idea of not taking points on a record. I mean, I think there's something radical about that. And I guess my question is, like, when, at what point, again, did you develop these mindsets? I'm sure there was no chance to get points on the first records you were recording. <laughs> I'm sure you were just hungry to do anything you would have recorded at a certain... So at what point were you actually, like, this is now actually, like, a real... Where did that where did that thinking come from? It is well, unfortunately radical. And so I, I guess where did what inspired in it? In the late eighties and early nineties, there started to be some general appreciation of the fact that big record labels were eventually going to start siphoning talent out of the underground and try to make money off of them. And so there were copies of contracts floating around that had been offered to people. And my band w was sent a few like trial balloons, uh, and stuff like that. And having put records out on my own and having licensed records to another record label, I knew what the margins were. I knew how much money what there was to, to make. On, you know, if you, if you keep your origination costs reasonable, I could figure out how much money was going to be made off of a record, right? Uh, so when somebody offered a contract to somebody else and I just did the math, it was obvious that it was a bad deal. Like, the standard deal was terrible. And the very good deal was still really bad, you know? Like, I remember there was a, there was a big 
to do about, I want to say in, in the late 80s or early 90s, it was either Madonna or Bruce Springsteen that got like a record setting contract where they were like they were getting something like 20 points or 19 points as a base royalty, right? Uh, and I worked it out on the same basis, that is, you know, subtracting the costs of origination of the thing, blah, 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 blah. And my band, who was a pipsqueak band that was selling a couple thousand records a year, not a big band, not even the biggest, not the biggest band on our label, not the biggest band in my neighborhood, right? Um, my band was making the equivalent of 24 or 25 points. We were getting a better deal than Bruce fucking Springsteen. <laughs> and so, like, a few exercises like that, just, like, open the hood and see what's actually going on, and you realize that the mainstream music business is a racket, and everything about it is a sub-racket. Like... You, you were talking about these functionaries like a booking agent, okay? Now, booking agents serve a useful purpose for bands that are touring all the time and they can't do their own business because they're busy playing shows and earning money. It's a perfectly reasonable proposition. But I just want you to consider that at the smallest end of the scale, like a band might get a, a couple of shows and the booking agent can make one phone call and book another show for them that's 400 miles away. And that one show might be worth four or five hundred dollars. So let's say it's worth five hundred dollars. And that booking agent is getting, let's say it's a it's a good booking agent that's being generous to the band and he's only taking ten percent. So that booking agent is getting fifty dollars for one phone call. Meanwhile, the band has to haul their ass four hundred miles, which is an eight hour drive, spend all the gas to get there find a place to crash or get a hotel room if it's, you know, at the end of the night there's nobody that'll let them crash, they end up having to get hotel rooms. They have to hump their gear up the stairs to Bobby's shit house or whatever it's, the <laughs> club is. They play their dismal show to people that don't want to see them because otherwise they would have been able to get that gig anyway, but the booking agent got them this meaningless show that they blew an entire day and you know, a hundred bucks in gas to get there. For, and then they have to turn around and go back from there to the other, whatever the next gig after that is. And they blow another 50 bucks in gas getting to there. And let's say you've got some overhead, like you have a sound man that you have to pay and you have to pay the sound man like a hundred bucks a night or whatever. So then from the 450 that's left after the booking agent, uh, you have to pay the sound man, your sound guy, a hundred bucks. You've, blown a hundred hundred and fifty dollars in gas and then you know you've also taken a day off of work in order to do this extra show so there's an opportunity cost there and if there are four of you in the band and that ends up if the remaining money ends up being pure pure profit and you dice it up amongst yourselves each of you is making less than fifty dollars for the gig so you're, you had to do two days worth of work and all of this time and all of this labor plus be in the band forever and have to listen to all the arguments and, you know, <laughs> and do the late night drive bit and have to put up with your bandmates' horrible taste in music on the radio. <laughs> you have to do all of that hard work plus the intellectual labor of generating a, a music and a performance that's going to be worth doing in front of an audience, you, you have to do all of that heavy lifting and you get paid less than the dude that made one phone call. And he's one of the good ones, right? <laughs> and so it's worse for everybody else. And there's always gonna be somebody in line who wants to do this thing for you, wants to do that thing for you for a percentage. And my rule of thumb has always been that if somebody wants to do some of your work for a percentage of what you would be getting paid otherwise, that guy is being overpaid. Because he knows that it's less work to do that than it is worth to make that money in another, ma another way. So the percentage payment scheme is always going to be overpaying the person that's getting a percentage. 
I mean, I doubt you have an answer for this, but then why do so many people... Because I feel like I've, I've laid the same argument out for people, and you probably have too, and then they go, and they're like, okay, I'm going to get a booking agent. Yeah. You know? And I'm, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm kind of wondering is, like, why do... Because you're right. The argument feels simple. It feels logical. Why do people then turn around and, and they just get a booking agent? And they get If a manager, you're starting a, from a baseline of no knowledge, working your way up to the point where you're comfortable calling 15 or 20 clubs to book a tour seems insurmountable but if you get there the next time it's trivial you know and but it's that initial hurdle of ignorance that puts people in a vulnerable position where they will i don't know how to do that is there any other way is there any way someone else can do it oh and he only wants 10 or 15 percent and then they ask the manager, who's taking another 10 or 15%, <laughs> do you think we should use this? Oh, that booking agent has a great reputation. You should definitely use that booking agent. OK, that's fine. Um, well, I guess we'll need a contract with him. Let me turn to my lawyer, who's also taking 10 or 15%, and say, is this a good contract with you? Yeah. Well, you know, it looks, let me, let me do, make a few modifications here for an hourly. And then, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there's just all of these spots where ignorance makes you vulnerable and there is an entire network of people who are set up to siphon to weaponize that ignorance and siphon money out of your life uh, and if you defend against that by knowing the first little bit you start to realize that you can know all of these things and you can do all of these things and keep all of the money and if you're keeping all of the money then you have to make a lot less to survive. So you can play marginal places where people don't, you know, where you're going to be playing to smaller shows, where you can keep the ticket prices low so you're not punishing your audience. And you can, instead of touring for 10 months out of the year, you can tour for three months out of the year and then have some kind of a comfortable lifestyle for the rest of the, of the year. Like, it's, it, all of these things interact with each other, but they're all based on the same notion that if, if you're ignorant of a, of a system, that system is going to suck everything it can out of you if you participate in it. I mean, it, yeah, it feels predatory. It feels like it's not just as a, maybe preying on ignorance, it's preying on a lack of financial resources. Like things like the points especially, right? No, put less money down, just pay me for life, you know, this <laughs> yeah, percent. Yeah. But you put less money down, and it's, it, it, it just it feels, they feel like they're predatory about either, either people who don't have as much money or don't have as much... Um, you not not I don't want to say intel like raw intelligence, but who just haven't really figured some of this stuff out yet. It feels like it's just somewhat people coming to take advantage of them and take money for life for but something it, that they could have just asked them one time and paid them a yeah. But there a rate. Is, bearing in mind that I don't necessarily think people who operate in this system are intentionally predatory or or are awful people. They are participating in an awful system, and. If they're unaware of an of an of an alternative, or if it has just they have just it's been ingrained in them that this is how you do things, then they would never question it, right? So, for years, it was a standard practice for a, a, the titular producer of a record to be paid a royalty, and the bigger the name the producer, the higher the royalty, right? That royalty is an origination cost for the, the record, which means that it comes directly from the money that would otherwise have gone to the band. It's a zero-sum game. So if the producer is paid X, that means the band makes their net income minus X, right? There's just no other way to do the math. And I didn't want to participate in that system. It just seemed unethical and it just like indefensible to me that knowing that these bands were op some of them are operating on a basis points level of nine points 10 points 12 points something like that and then knowing that they have managers that are taking percentages out of all of that and that there may be an A&R guy that's taking some of the money out or a, a lawyer that's taking some of the money out if I'm getting paid three points out of a potential nine points that means there might be two points left to divide up amongst the entire band. I mean, that's, that's just indefensible to me. I just can't, I can't fathom operating that way. But if I were a capitalist and I wanted to maximize my own bottom line, then that would definitely be the way that I would approach it. I would be like, well, what's the absolute maximum I can get paid here? 
and what's the absolute maximum amount of time that I can earn that money, and let's do that, you know. Uh, I, again, I feel like the way I do things is more sustainable, and part of the way I know that is that a lot of the record producers that we're getting paid on those royalty arrangements, a lot of them are, you know, selling real estate now or whatever, you know, and I'm still making records every day, so. Okay, I want to shift gears a bit, but it's still related, and I want to, I want to talk about the internet. Um, so in 1993, um, you wrote your problem with music piece, which was really influential to me and shaping my worldview, probably a lot of other people. Um, but then in 2014, you delivered the, this keynote in Melbourne, um, and the narrative, at least, the narrative was that the sort of problem of music had been solved by the internet. And I guess before we go too much further, is that even is that a, was that narrative a fair characterization or is of, of what you were saying or not? I, I wouldn't have phrased it that way. What The way I would have phrased it is that the structures and systems that exploited people in the era of physical media, that is in the record business, where you had to sell physical copies of a record or CD to make money, those structures and those systems were either in the midst of collapsing or had collapsed. So their power over the individuals was lessening or ha ha was gone, right? Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other ways that things could go bad, but the biggest problems of the physical media, media era, which were that the access to an audience was controlled by gatekeeper corporations and patronage systems like payola and the playlist systems for radios and, thing, and video channels and things like that, those systems were bypassed by the direct access to an audience that bands have through the internet. You can put your music up on YouTube or SoundCloud or whatever, and you can get to an audience immediately, instantly, for free, right? And I just, I cannot perceive of that as being anything but an enormous net positive result. What it did as a secondary effect was that it made it almost impossible to make a ton of money by selling records. Um, and I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm sorry that you run a record label <laughs> for that reason only, because you're not going to get rich at it, which is kind of a shame, but all of the other aspects of the internet and its influence on music make all of the other aspects of music better, and you get to participate in that. So I guess this is what I wanted to challenge, um, because you're right. I do run a record label, but it's 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 probably about as anti-capitalist as a record as a company could be. And I think I share a lot of your values. And I wrote a response to your piece. We discussed it, but I think the conclusion we reached was you telling me that you didn't think I was using the same internet that that you were. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but <laughs> but the point is is that I. I I was trying to lay out an approach where let, let's take money out of the picture. Let's not talk about the compressed money. And what I saw, I saw the, I, I saw what you described and described just now as the great promise of the internet. This is everything the internet promises. This is why I signed on to the internet for the first time. This is going to be great. And then what I saw actually happen was actually a more efficient system for furthering the problems you described in 1993 with using technology of the internet to just enable a faster and more efficient, not killing machine, but machine for siphoning power into fewer hands. I saw all the same middlemen you were just talking about. They just moved from a physical media company to a digital media company. They were, they were no longer at radio, they were at Spotify. They were no longer, you know, here, they were there. It's like when, you, you know, the rats, you, you, you take the rats out of your house, you put them outside, they just, they, they run right back in, you know. Um, and because they got, they need somewhere to go. And the industry didn't get smaller, the industry grew. And it, it, it's just that the, the people didn't go anywhere. Um, and it seemed like the internet actually made it more efficient. It was, there was, in some ways it was technology for actually a tighter grip on, on consumers. So I'm not even talking about the margins or the money. That, that, that's just kind of what I saw. Um, and I guess I'm wondering well, if, I, if you agree my, or disagree in what you, what you kind of saw. Yeah, I disagree. My, the, 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 the example, that I would, I would posit would be like, let's say you had in your mind that you wanted to buy a particular record from a particular band 
in the pre-internet era. It might take you a very long time to find it, and when you finally found some place that had it, you would have to either order it from them or physically go to the place and buy it, and then bring it home and hook up the hi-fi and drop the needle on it, and then discover that it sucked. <laughs> right? You're right, yep. It would take days and dollars and exerted effort to find out that you were disappointed in something, right? Now, it's trivial. Like, I could, na I could name a band and a song right now, and before I had finished the sentence, someone in this room could have found it, heard it, and formed an opinion of it, right? That, again, I, have, I cannot conceive of that as anything but an enormous net positive. There are bands whose initial existence was cons conscribed to a very small number of records sold, a very small geographic area, a very small audience. Now, because their stuff has been repopulated onto the internet, there are people the world over who are familiar with these formerly marginal people, like people whose music has meant, may have meant something great to me or the, the 20 other people that were into it at the time. But uh, now there, there, may, there could be an audience of millions of people who are influenced by this music and who appreciate their, their place in the culture. Again, no money is changing hands. But I can't see that as anything but an enormous net positive. And what you're describing as people taking control, I see as people operating the systems on which we are all hitching a ride for free and satisfying our curiosity and our interest at no cost and, and trivial effort. I guess I would say there's a, there's a huge cost when the system is being operated by Google, by Spotify, and we're starting to see some of that fine, like, there were many years there was, didn't feel like there was cost, and everybody was sort of on board, and now we're starting to begin to see the cost of all the data that they've been gathering for free for us, and now they're starting to use it against us in certain other ways, in political ways, and, and I think we do see that in music. I think one of the reasons you and I, and probably certain people of our age and older, found the internet so amazing was because we knew what to look for in the first place. You knew to, this thing, I, this 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 record that I've never been able to find in a store my whole life. I can Google it, and this is unbelievable, right? But I kind of was looking forward in this. I knew about it in this old world, and I worry for people growing up in this new world that they're never going to know about these records because of the amount of the sheer amount of control. Like you and I were able to get out of the old system, right? Because we didn't. Pretty quickly after going to the first record stores you ever went to, whether probably either Big Box or something close, you realize there were these other ones. And then, then you realize there were these other, other ones. And then you realize there were these other, other ones. And then you might have found a mail order catalog for this really weird shit, right? Like, with it no longer being like that, you're never, you're never leaving that big, that big box store. Anymore. You're, you're, you're stuck there. You're stuck at the sort of hot wall. You're stuck at the... Well, and I, that's, what I, that's what I worry about, okay, right? Okay, like, um, let me just demonstrate something very quickly here. Um, in the pre-internet era, most people's music experience was fairly common, meaning that in a town that had several radio stations, everyone would be familiar with those radio stations and everyone would be exposed to the same playlists. In a town that had a small number of record stores, everybody would have the same records to choose from. So tastes in locales tended to be sort of homogenous. People tended to be familiar with all of the same things. Like, I hated Ted Nugent, I knew every one of his songs. Sorry, I hated serial child rapist Ted Nugent. <laughs> Yet I knew every one of serial child rapist Ted Nugent's songs. I try always to refer to him as serial child rapist <laughs> Ted Nugent in the hopes that someday the Google search function would autocomplete <laughs> to serial child rapist Ted Nugent. Okay, um, I'm going to name a few bands that I know from personal experience have sold records in the quantities of, say, 100 to 500 copies. And I want to see if anybody in this audience is familiar with any of these bands. It's not a scientific experiment, you know. No, I understand that. <laughs> uh, my, point, my point being that... It, uh, okay. A band from Deerfield, Illinois, called The Mentally Ill. Anybody in this room hear that band? One, two, 
Okay. John Solomon qualifies. <laughs> the Mentally Ill were a band of high school students who were friends in Deerfield, Illinois. They went into a jingle studio and recorded a seven inch single. Um, one song was about John Wayne Gacy, the serial murderer, and it was about the basement of his house and it was called Gacy's Place. The flip side of it was a song mocking a cancer victim called Tumor Boy. <laughs> this seven-inch single was pressed in an edition of 200. The band did not know how or to whom they could sell this record. <laughs> so their means of distribution was that they went to area record shops in the Chicagoland metropolitan area and they put their record in the singles racks for free. <laughs> so that other people in the record store would be able to buy this record. With, they would not get any of the money, of course. It was a kind of reverse shoplifting, <laughs> right? So up until the advent of the internet, I'm fairly certain that I could have polled not just this room, not just this building, not just this university, not just this city, perhaps this state, and not been able to find a single person who is familiar with the mentally ill. In this room, there are two people that are familiar with the mentally ill. I find that a staggering accomplishment, right? And it's all down to the ubiquity of music on the internet. So what, when, when you say, it's hard for people to find unusual or uncommon things because they don't have these oddball places to look. My point is that it's unnecessary to have oddball places to work because the same Google that will help me find waterproof moccasins will expose me to literally any kind of music that I can imagine. Okay, uh, let me throw another one out there. Uh, there was a, an experimental band from San Francisco in the early 1980s uh, called Factrix. Is anybody in this room familiar with the band Factrix? Okay, they never put out a record at all, so that's... That, that's <laughs> uh, it's not a scientific experience. Not a good, not a, okay, there was a bar in Chicago where all the punk bands played. It was a gay bar that, w that did punk shows uh, on occasion. Um, there was a live album recorded there. The bar was called Oz. The live album was called Busted at, Busted at Oz. Is there anyone in this room that's familiar with the live album Busted at Oz from the Chicago Punk Underground? Same person. Okay. <laughs> well, there's one. It's, it's a specific one. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> all right. So, I, um, all right. How about... Uh, <laughs> no. I think we get it. Okay. And I, yeah. and, and I no, and I and I completely get what you're saying. And again, I think for me, the internet really did feel like this life-changing thing when it first started. Because I was I was spending all of my time, all of my time and energy tracking down the equivalent of a busted at Oz or a mentally ill seven inch. I was spending my time, my energy, just hoping to hear these things that people like John, the one who had heard him, had told me <laughs> had told me about. Like there's this record, you know. I was spending my so. It was amazing, but th I think the, the flip side is it's also a bit like, like drinking from a fire hose, right? Where it's yeah. like you're not really getting any water when you drink from a, from a, from a maybe, you, I don't know, there's a scene in UHF where it happens. Um, <laughs> but I'm not sure if you're really getting, um, yeah. quenching your thirst that what way. You're, what you're after is a curated experience. Well, that, no, but the whole, no, because the problem with the curated experience is that it's now going through one of two to three places, so it's being curated by, I think, no, curation's also a problem, I, I, I guess. My point is that, like, paradox. every one of our friends, everyone that I know, listens to some shit that I've never heard of. And now I can get turned on to that, and I can immediately access it and find out if it's for me as well. And, again, I, don't, I can't see that as anything but a good thing, right? In, in that if I stumble across somebody that I know who has obscure interests and they share something with me and I'm into it, I can satisfy my curiosity about it instantly and that seems great. I agree with you that there is so much out there that it's overwhelming and you can't, can't necessarily make sense of it uh, in your fire hose analogy, but I also feel like an abundance of things that I might like 
available to me instantly for free is not bad. Well, I think I think there is like a weird paradox of access, and maybe there's a social scientist that's un- written about that or understood it more. But it does feel like I, I mean, I, it's, I think it's sometimes easier to see in politics, where we have this free market of ideas that we've never had before. There's everyone has a voice in politics now, and you know, via the internet, and what the result is is fascism, right? It's it, it's Trump. It's it's it, and we're seeing it every it's it's Boris, right? Boris Johnson, like the weird result of everyone having a voice for the first time ever is actually fascism. And I feel like we're kind of seeing that in music, or at least that's what I'm feeling. For, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking about any of the money side. I don't care about the money side either. But what I feel like I'm seeing in the music side is every artist that has an equal voice that they've never had before thanks to these platforms, and the result is actually more domination of the people that had the domination in the in the 80s and 90s. And I think that's what, it's, it's hard to see, but I feel like, and I don't know why, I, I'm not the social scientist that has an explanation for why that's the case, but I see that as the case. Yeah, I, I just fundamentally disagree. Like, I don't feel like I am, I don't feel like I have music thrust at me in the homogenous sort of, formal like standardized way that I did throughout the 70s and the 80s and the 90s when there were only two radio stations in my hometown where there was only one video channel on television where there was only one record store in my neighborhood and my choices were extremely limited I don't feel you know like you would walk into a record store and there would be a big cardboard cutout of Rod Stewart there and I get well I guess Rod Stewart has a new record out you know <laughs> the fuck do I care about Rod Stewart's new record but I guess I know about it now like that doesn't happen to me at all now uh like I genuinely don't feel like I'm I, I one of my principal complaints about the promotion of music as an active enterprise is that I don't like this notion that someone else is going to thrust something at me and say, this is the good one, you should buy this. If it's not a friend of mine, I don't give a fuck what you think, right? Just stop doing that to me. You, you just made me hate that band, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I don't feel like that happens nearly to the extent that it did when the number of channels of communication were a lot smaller, when there were fewer outlets when there were fewer you know sure you could find trusted sources like you could find a fanzine that sort of catered to your tastes and you would, could believe in their editorial perspective or whatever but as far as the mainstream media was concerned and the and the popular radio and television of the and stuff like that like like i really genuinely don't feel like i'm being forced to interact with culture that isn't for me anymore Whereas I did feel like that through my whole adolescence and up until, I, th- I think that's the weird, the weird problem. And I want, and then we can kind of end this little <laughs> this thing. But I think no one ever feels forced, right? If you talk, no one ever feels brainwashed. No one ever feels coerced. But that you can look at data, you can look at patterns, and we, you, you can kind of see actually people are all. This has changed, and, and I feel like when you're looking at, you know, the the top one percent of artists are, you know, they're growing in strength, you know, in this new. When you think people would be listening to more stuff, you're actually seeing the opposite. Um, and so there's sort of these, I, I agree, you never feel, no one ever feels like they're being convinced to do anything. That's, that is, you know, there's theory there. So I don't want to, I don't want to harp on this too much. I, I think we can keep thinking about it. Um, and I want to make sure I leave time for questions and not end on a, on a, on a weird note. So I have a fun, <laughs> I have like a fun question that I was just kind of, kind of thinking of about the internet, which is, um, just knowing you and what you're talking about. And what was your, what was your first experience? So I was talking to my, my class about it, like my first experiences on the internet and like what that was like. And it was kind of, what were your first experiences with the, with the internet? <laughs> like, um, I had an email address. And then I found out that there was a thing called the list server that you could use to get um, group conversations. And I, I signed up for a couple of list serves. One of them was for Ampex tape machine owners, the Ampex list. Probably and one, one of them was a uh, punk and underground music list server called the Chug Changa list. Anybody here ever hear of the Chug Changa list? No. Is it John Solomon again? John Solomon. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, and those, th- that was my first experience of a uh, disparate diasporous group communicating in real time as though they were in the same room or in the same neighborhood. Like I never did internet relay chats or I never did any chat room type stuff. Um, but being, being able to find people with very specific interests and have them communicate in a kind of a free-for-all 
was I thought was a really valuable experience, and and you you know you very quickly learn which voices you can ignore and which voices are are have substance, and I feel like that was part of the discernment process that was necessary for me to be able to interact with people on the internet and and not be not fall victim to it. Um, there was a there were the news groups on the Usenet. Um, there were some early ones that catered to other areas of my interest. There was one called rec.audio.pro, which was about pro audio. It was like audio engineers, recording engineers. And that's where a lot of um, equipment for sale lists would get posted and things like that. So I, out, I was able to, as a, not an early adopter, but as a sort of contemporaneous adopter of the internet, I was able to get access to secondhand equipment being sold peer to peer before there was an eBay and before there was anything like you know reverb or any of those other specialty things, so I was able to get very good deals on secondhand equipment from other professionals just because I was able to recognize what was what on the list and I could contact that person that day and uh, arrange to buy something within 24 hours. That if it was posted out into the world, it might take him a month to sell that thing otherwise. You know, so. Uh, those are my first sort of formative experiences with internet, and then the ease of international communication with inter with the internet with email. It used to be the case that you'd have to call, make international telephone calls at enormous expense, in order to get somebody to say no, you, we wouldn't buy your record, <laughs> or no, you can't come play here. <laughs> like like just to get somebody to say no could take you days and many rounds of phone calls that each phone call cost you 10 pounds or $10 or whatever, you know. Like that was, that was a huge change. Um, and as everything else happened in the internet, like as you started to get things like cell phone service out in the boonies and um, GPS for your van for when you were driving on tour where you could just enter the address of the club and get there by like by magic you know <laughs> without having to pull over in the rain and make a payphone call to the the one guy you know in town who would give you directions on how to get there from where you were lost you know like uh, like everything about the internet just made life as a musician like incrementally easier all along the way remembering that uh, the maps thing the other like recently I, the I, Rand McNally yeah well the Rand McNally but even even the internet maps we had to print it out and if for some reason you strayed from the printout that was it yeah. like you, had to, <laughs> you had to go back home <laughs> and print another yeah, one out every band had the the big spiral bound Rand McNally road atlas in the van and every page had a corner torn off where there had to be a phone number written down at some point and there was you know like there was the, the highlighter route and then the sharpie route for what's the actual way to get there you know <laughs> yeah it's wild um, I just want to thank you for the lovely conversation and for coming to visit Drexel. And, thank you, you for know. having me. This has been fun yeah. and easy. <laughs>